Another thing that I saw, uh, a really common theme, was the, the fact that people saw PLC, the intent of PLC, the, uh, the uh, uh, usefulness of PLCs was helping. Helping students, helping teachers, uh, helping one another. They saw it as something that helped. And then one of the things, and I couldn't help but, uh, but notice this, was just the, uh, the, the term everyone. What does PLC do for everyone? Well, uh, <clears throat> or what does it ask of everyone? Everyone is equal. These are just some samples, some, some examples of uh, responses that came from, uh, came out of our uh, survey. Within the PLC, everyone is equal. Okay? We don't have a uh, we don't have a big bad mama bear. We don't have a domineering uh, a gentleman or anything like that within the PLC. Everybody has an equal voice, and everybody is expected to contribute equally. Everyone benefits. Everyone's expected to participate. Everyone contributes. I like this one. Everyone is needed. You know, whether you've got the brand spanking new uh, 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 straight out of school teacher, or you've got the 30-year veteran, everyone is expected to contribute and everyone is needed. Everyone brings something good to the table. I've got a, a, a student teacher right now, not even a student teacher, a student observer, um, and uh, had her teach a couple of lessons, and uh, frankly, I learned a lot from watching her. Um, <clears throat> everyone has a role. I love that. Uh, everyone has a job. Within the PLC, everyone is needed. Now, a PLC is intended, and this, came, this emerged out of your responses to the, to the survey. PLC uh, is involved with the growth. But the growth of who? Well, it's the, our ultimate goal, our profession, is the growth of students. But is that the, is that the focus of the PLC? Many of us thought that the focus of the PLC, and I tend to agree, is the growth of the teacher. Making better teachers, and making uh, good teachers great, and making great teachers amazing. I like the emphasis on professional. I saw that word, profession, professional, come up a lot, and I feel like that reflects some of the emphasis that we tried to bring last week, uh, as far as if we consider, our, consider this a profession, consider ourselves professionals, then what do we do that mirrors other professionals uh, within, their, uh, within their workplaces? And uh, as far as consulting one another and, uh, and working on that and supporting one another. Um, and then finally, the process. Now this is, this is more kind of a general theme that came out, but uh, uh, the PLC process is one that improves over time. You're not going to be a rock star at it immediately, and especially if this is a if this is a new process for you, then it's an emerging uh, competency. It takes effort. It doesn't just happen. You don't just sit around in a room, sit around the table, and just poof, PLC happens and, uh, and, it, and it changes your life. You get better at it over time. It takes patience to get better at something over time, something that uh, you know is not always my strong suit, and it requires humility. Which, luckily, that is my strong suit. I'm amazing at being humility. So, uh, so I hope this was uh, I hope this was eye opening for you, and I hope this kind of helps validate uh, uh, your uh, your participation and your response to this. Thank you.
because they take time. And if we are going through every question um, that quickly, then we're not really uh, getting into the questions in depth as we should be. So today we're just going to be looking at the first question. So are we well, uh, and we will understand the purpose of the first essential question, and our I will statement is I will be able to categorize a KUD and unpack the essentialities, um, which is what we really should be doing when we look at uh, that first essential question with the So our activity for today, uh, you did get a link in the email from Ms. Tapia, but I'll have a link up here in a second. Um, it is another Padlet, and these questions are going to be up there first. What are the four questions, critical questions of the PLC? And then is your team clear on the action line to the four critical questions of the PLC? So, um, you're going to have one member of your um, PLC team uh, go to the following link, because we're only going to, last meeting there were so many responses at once, we're kind of trying to hone that in. And so each PLC will come up with a response. Um, so that is the link, or if you still have the email, you can go to the, uh, go to that link and click it in uh, the email from the second this topic. And the instructions for what you should be doing um, are on there, so I'll go ahead and make sure So as you are talking um, with your group, uh, first off, does uh, your group know what the four critical questions are of the PLC? Do you guys have a pretty clear knowledge of it? Um, and then are you clear on the actions that are aligned um, with those four questions? So you're going to turn and talk, answer those two questions, we're going to be able to see instead of upload like this
more questions now because I'm really happy that most of us know them. Um, but now the, the second question we're talking about, are you clear on the actions? Um, if so, what actions are your, what actions do your team um, oh, do or what are you guys putting in there to answer these four questions? So I do see that everyone's putting the questions in there. Um, but what are we doing to make sure that we, that we are getting those questions? So let's focus on, on that a little bit more too. What actions are we taking to make sure those four questions are being answered? from collaborating. So again, 
what can we get from this collaboration, bringing in everyone's ideas, um, and making sure that everyone is contributing together, like AP3, I'm not sure what AP3 team that was, but they said, uh, we know what we're doing, everyone contributes in every meeting, and we collaborate well. So, so that's what we're looking for, that everyone contributes. Um, I don't know, I just remember hearing that if there is one person in PLC that you could like not have in there and do without, then you aren't working together as a PLC. So every single person, every single voice in there should be um, should be contributing and should be being heard. Um, I do want to, because I'm from English too, uh, we talked about um, it saying that we predict possible misunderstandings and then scaffold toward the main concept. So um, in our last uh, PLC meeting, uh, we, there was a little heat, a little argument in there because we were all kind of putting in our ideas and we all wanted to make sure that we were doing um, what was good for the students and making sure whatever concept, like, I don't know if we're going to get that the way that we have put it together, how can we scaffold it a little bit more? And so in one of the, um, in one of the courses, or I, I don't know what's called, that we, uh, that I was in, when I went to the PLC conference, he, kind of, he talked about purposeful confrontation, that you shouldn't just be sitting back and like, I don't want to get in there. If, it, if you have an idea, if you know what's best for the students, you need to put your ideas in there and make sure that even if there is some confrontation, you know, afterwards it was like, we, we hugged, we talked it out, we're good again. So there isn't anything like you shouldn't, you shouldn't, you shouldn't be afraid to put your ideas in there because it's about what is best for those students and how can we get them to learn it, what happens when they don't, and all those different questions. Um, so if it does get a little bit uncomfortable, you know, you break your lunch and then you come back and then, you know, we start over again. Or, you know, go home and come back with a fresh, uh, with a fresh start. But um, sometimes you're going to have those difficult meetings and you should have those difficult meetings if it's for the betterment of the students and what they're learning and how we're working together to make sure that that's uh, that we are learning and helping the students learn um, best. So, um,
math as an example. Math builds on itself. You can't skip straight to Algebra 2 if you don't have those um, basic concepts leading up to it. So is this a skill that they're going to need leading into the next um, course? Uh, does it have leverage? Is it something that kind of uh, crosses the curriculum from one concept or from one content to another? Is it applicable outside of your subject? Or is it something that's applicable across a wide range of your, of your curriculum? It's not just something we're going to hit it once and never speak about it again. Um, is it something you're going to continue revisiting throughout the year? And then for those of us in testing subjects, is it a big part of the state assessment? Um, so for those of us who have a, a STAR test associated with our course, some of these decisions have already been made for us because the state of Texas has decided what our students need to know according to that, um, that STAR test. But particularly for those of you who aren't in tested areas, <coughs> these are some very quick, critical questions you should be discussing um, to make sure that you as a team are focusing on what is actually essential um, for your students to be able to know and to master in order to move on. Um, an important team would be something that that um, is important for the concept development. Maybe it's something that supports one of those essential standards. They absolutely need to know this essential. Um, and so in order to understand that essential TEAK, it's important for them to have this background information that goes with it. And then as teachers, we all have those subjects that in our, in our content that I would love to have time to teach the animal kingdom. But I just, there's just not room in my curriculum. It'd be nice to know if I somehow managed to come up with an extra day somewhere or, um, or after star is over or whatever. It'd be nice to know these things, but it's not something that I need to be spending essential, critical time on. And so in your PLCs, as you're discussing what do we want our students to know, as your PLC team, you should be focusing on those essential teams. You shouldn't necessarily be spending any discussion time on what is the nice to know stuff. And so I think for me, when hearing this at the conference, it kind of took the burden off of trying to discuss every team all the time. As, as a team, we should be focusing on collaborating on the essential teams, and then the stuff that's important and nice to know is more or less left up to the individual teacher. I'm not saying you don't collaborate on those things, but that shouldn't be your focus. Your focus should be the absolute essential, this is what they must leave my class knowing. Any questions on that? Comments, concerns? No, it's like... 
like words in Casco Amontillado that are in Italian. Like the Spanish words in House of Mango Street that kids would have to use context clues to figure out. Oh, like the word beagle in Rusty <laughs> Oski. <laughs> so what category do you think this falls in? I think it falls underneath essential because students will need to use context clues. My English 1 team is meeting, and I know they're never up to any good, so I'm going to coordinate. <laughs> <laughs> Essential teeth. Uh -oh. <laughs> what does that look like, packing your uh, essential teeth? Well, you just came in and we've just been discussing how our students need to know the meaning of foreign words inside of the text. And I think this is something that's going to be essential for them in the real world as well. Alright, let's go on to the next teeth. The next teeth is 5B. Analyze how writers develop complex and believable characters and their motivations. Is that something that's going to be on the star test? Yeah, but it's also something they will need to know for other grade levels and college. So that would make it an essential team, right? Yeah, Candy, I think you're right. Go team! <laughs> <laughs> Let's go to our next team, to see. Relate the figurative language of short fiction to its historical and cultural setting. What do we think? I think that could be a teeth that's more essential for a pre-AP class to give our students context to use on the AP exam. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Will our students really understand the connection? But this is definitely something we could hit on if we have time or have free class discussion. So I guess we'll put that on in our if we have time category. Based on your students' needs and progress, you can decide if you want to cover it or not. Sounds good. Our next teeth is the two point B. Analyze the influence of literary archetypes and traditions on modern literature. What type of archetypes are they referring to? Which ones would we want to focus on? Character archetypes and situational archetypes. Well, is that really essential to the main focus of our story? Hmm. I think you should put that in the important category because archetypes will also be addressed in the following years. Okay, this is great and all, but how do we address these essential teeths to our students? Well, let's go ahead and unpack the teeths now. What strategies could we possibly use to hit these essential standards? Hey, I have a vocabulary video that my students love in previous years. They wrapped it all day. Show it, yeah, show it. Wait, what is a vocabulary? A vocabulary is an account that our school has paid for us to use. And we and it has great videos about vocab that kids can relate to in a hip hop form. What is hip hop? That's cool music the kids listen to. I can't see. It's about word choice. We have to be careful about how we choose our words. <laughs> That's great. Can you share it with me? Absolutely. Yeah, I feel like our collab kids would really connect with that. What about our diction rainbows that we did? I know we already did it, but y'all can definitely use it. <clears throat> what is a diction rainbow? Do you have any samples? Like those paint sample things we see on Pinterest? No worries, Willie. I have examples that I can show you. Let me get them really quick. <laughs> oh my gosh, she's gone forever! <laughs> Hopefully she brings Candy back. I really identify with angry. Oh yeah, I like this. I think my sixth period was like it. It's fun and engaging. Come on. Different stories to hit this team at the 
Pete, I think the kids would really love that. Yeah, our kids aren't going to do that. No, sorry. Not going to show. It's not going to happen. Just put that away. Please, I just ran into me in English too. Don't make me do that. <laughs> it's too long to cover the whole story, and it'll confuse our collab babies. Well, this is why we would just pick and choose what stories we want to read. Yeah, but no. This is where that DI comes in. As long as we're all hitting the same standard, then we can teach it however we want. I agree. Keep in mind we should all be doing some the same cumulative assessments on that standard. Okay, we need to move on to what's important. Lunch. <laughs> I think it's time for a break. I'm starving. Okay, I know y'all are going to hate me, but lunch will work. I know, I know. I do it every time. We need to finish unpacking the teeth when we get back. And then after we do that, we need to talk about common, formative, and summative assessment. That's where we're going to go from there. So as you're eating lunch, please think about what we could do to hit these teeth. Yes. Yes, ma'am. Woohoo! Go team! Awesome. I swear most of the time I do more than just stand around, but. All right, so um, just to give you a, a visual of what that should look like, um, categorizing the teeth. This is a chart we kind of use um, to decide whether or not a teeth is essential. So if you see there to the left, um, we have the teeth clear pieces or position based on logical reasons supported by precise and relevant evidence. That's a right. teeth from English too. So the question is, is that something you're going to need to be on the school? It's something that they're going to need for the following year, English 3. Are you guys going to need that for the yeah. next year? Yes, okay. Uh, does it have leverage? Can this be used in other subjects? Raise your hand if you guys incorporate these statements in your work. Right? Okay, so there it is. And then, is it a major test? I don't want to standardize test. English 2 is tested, and so, yes. So it meets all the standards, or all the qualifications of essential teeth. So it's something that we needed there. So, um, I'm going to give you guys about five minutes to look at one of your teeths in your curriculum, because I believe Ms. Tapia asked everyone to bring um, the upcoming unit, right? And I want you to identify one teeth that you believe to be essential, okay? So, in your PLCs, identify one teeth that you believe meets all of those standards.
to find one T with A being essential or at least close to it, yeah? Alright, so once you categorize the T's and you found the fourth six per unit that you believe are essential, the next step is to unpack that T and really look at what that T is asking the students to do. So if you look at the thesis statement uh, T that I just showed you, um, these are some knowledge uh, based knowledge that our students are going to need that they may or may not come in knowing. As you know, you're going to have kids in your class that are all over the place with their um, previous knowledge. So, vocabulary, you're going to know what a thesis statement is. Uh, position statement, that's another term that's on star for thesis statement. If they only know thesis statement and they see that on the, on the star test position statement, we just put our kids in a really bad position, right? So, you're going to need to know um, common vocabulary for the same term. Uh, they're going to need to know what relevance is. They're going to need to know how to look at source, uh, sources. And in order to write that thesis statement, they're going to need to have some basic command of grammar, spelling, and punctuation, right? Um, and that's just the knowledge piece. The reasoning piece is how to distinguish between relevant and irrelevant reasons. How to distinguish between valid and invalid sources, right? You can't just go to Facebook and say that this is why something is. Um, how to use personal experience as reasons, and how to revise a sentence to be concise. These are all the things that the T is asking us to do. So, if you look at that list, it's a lot of detail that really goes into this one T, um, which is probably why it's really difficult for our students to do. I mean, I remember being in college, and I would still get on my paper sometimes. These to say that it's awkward, these to say that it's too vague, these to say that it's too specific, right? So, um, Doing this is really eye-opening, at least it was for me and my group. Um, and a team of us went and did this at the PLC conference in Dallas. And it was really eye-opening all the background that needs to go in, all the planning needs to go into addressing just one team. Um, so what I'd like to do right now is sort of look at that team that you picked and try to unpack a little bit more. What are the students going to need to know in order to be able to complete the task that the team is asking?
want to tell you a little bit about all the learning. Everybody received an email from Ms. Tavia yesterday saying that Sharon is going to be in week 118 all day long today. But please go during your conferences so that you can learn about the subscription of all the learning that the campus has purchased for us for this year. Um, I will tell you that all the learning is one of my most favorite things next to your class, to use in the classroom. It saves me so much time. And the kids love it because they get immediate feedback on their quick little assessments, quizzes, or activities. It's a great way to check for understanding. It's very easy to get your students loaded into all the learning. It takes maybe 15 minutes to get them all loaded. Once they're loaded, the only thing they're doing after that point is creating a quick little key that you just put some buttons in. And then when the students come up with their little scanner sheet, Put it under the iPad and it immediately tells you um, what their score is as well as the teeth that they struggle with. So students are able to see it right away. What we started doing with, ge with world geography because we used, um, we tried, we're trying to do everything with common assessments and putting it all under CMS. We all know when we go to the scanner, if we're lucky enough to get on the scanner when somebody's not using it, then we're lucky then that it's actually working. Then we're lucky if the kids bubble things incorrectly and we don't have to go back and do it. And then maybe they put their student ID number on it or not. So when you're scanning for those big CMS or benchmark tests, it's, it gets very time consuming and annoying. So what we did with geography, we're now doing our CMS tests for benchmarks and our summative, our end of the unit assessments. Everything else we're using, we're also doing common formative assessments for our quick quizzes every week. And there's only 10 questions for each one. We're doing those now in the classroom. And with all the learning, you're still able to create a PLC. Still get the same kind of data that you get with CMS. It's just quick and instant. You're able to do it with your teacher iPad. And I can't tell you the amount of time that it saves. So while the initial setup will take a little bit of time, it's very user friendly once you get in there and start learning it. It really is truly worth the time of going in today during your conference. Learn how to do it, set up your account, start playing with it. If you have any questions, you can always come and call our me. I'll be more than happy to help you with it. Uh, I just can't tell you enough how absolutely wonderful it is and how much time, time it saves you and how much the kids love it. They all fight over who's going to get to scan and what their score is. And it's, it really is quite wonderful. So that's today in D118. The representative from all the North will be here doing the training. Um, what I just told you about is very quick, uh, quick functional uses of it. There's all kinds of amazing things that it actually does once you get more into that. With it, it'll even upload all of the scores directly in the grade book with just like two clicks, so you don't have to go in and transfer to that. It really is wonderful. So please take the time going through that today. Thank you everybody for your attention this morning. You're dismissed.